Hey, if you're a fan of great music and great stories, we've got a great guest coming right up for you. Stick around for our Uncommon Convo with Brad Nye. Hi, I'm Dennis Vandergast. Join me in a series of entertaining and interesting conversations with entertaining and interesting people. We'll explore various aspects of the human experience and what makes life more fun. This is Uncommon Combos. Hi there. Welcome to Uncommon Combos. I'm your host, Dennis Vandergast. And before I introduce our guest for today, I'd like to ask you to please subscribe and like Uncommon Convos on your favorite podcast platform. Additionally, uh, you can find links to the video recordings for this and all of our episodes at UncommonCombos.com. And from there, you can comment and make suggestions as to who you'd like to see as uh, upcoming guests on future episodes. So I've known Brad and I for over 40 years, which is extraordinary, given the fact that we're both only 35 years old. Um <laughs> Brad's the type of guy that you might not talk to for ages, and then you pick right up where you left off and feel like you just spoke to each other yesterday, which, of course, in this instance, we did just speak yesterday. But uh, but <laughs> usually you, that's – yeah, thank you, man. Um, usually that's not the case. Um, you know, like with most friends, we've, we've had our lives diverge and converge over the years, and, you know, we've both gone in uh, different directions. But believe me when I say that Brad's journey – has been much more interesting than mine and more interesting than most people for that matter. Um, ever since I've known, known him, Brad has been creating musical media content as a producer, composer, musician, and singer. He studied at the Musicians Institute of Technology in Hollywood and then accepted a position as an assistant tour manager for Van Halen's 1984 tour and then for Hall & Oates' Big Bam tour. As I said, you know, much more interesting than, than my <laughs> journey. Many people will know him as the lead vocalist and co-writer for the popular band Dick Holiday and the Bamboo Gang, which was signed to A&M Records and toured nationally doing 200 uh, shows a year while sponsored by genuine or Miller Genuine Draft. He also co-wrote, produced, and performed lead v, uh, vocals for the first supersized commercial for McDonald's and has co-written and produced national radio commercials for Brown's Chicken and Miller Genuine Draft. He's co-written um, a full-length feature screenplay, Cheyenne, um, and that movie's in development. I'm going to want to talk to him about that. He co-produced the soundtrack for that movie as well. Last year, Brad co-founded Old Bank Media Group with his partners, David Allen and David's future Country Hall of Fame songwriter wife, Leslie Satcher. That group, along with a number of other talented musicians and writers, created Pod Plays, uh, the family-friendly podcast embedded with the epic songs written from hit Nashville songwriters, which debuted at number 13 on the Apple podcast charts. And if, as if that weren't enough, 2020 also gave birth to a new <laughs> R&B band, Hubcap Moses, uh, for which Brad and Nashville uh, keyboard ace Tim Akers lead a group of extremely talented session players. That band was immediately signed to AHP Records. Brother, it's good to see you, man. Thanks for being here. So... <laughs> That's good. good. That's a that's good long intro. Great to see you. Great to talk with you. Yeah, you know, you've obviously <laughs> had. I think a, we're done. Uh, yeah, we're done. That's it. Thank you. Um, we, you've obviously had a, a crazy <laughs> and, and a night. blessed life. Yeah. Um, and and you know, we're gonna play a little bit of this is this uh, is your life because uh, I, I want the audience I want the audience to really get to understand who you are. Um, so even though. Um, I, I might have known it at the time. I was, I you know, I was doing my my research in in preparation for today, and I found found out that you were actually born in Seattle, and then you moved to the Quad Cities. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Well, a little town outside of Seattle called Pasco, Washington, where I was okay. born, lived there about a year, and then moved into Seattle, a little suburb called Magnolia, but right off the fisherman's wharf and lived there till i was almost seven yeah and then what pro prompted you guys what what prompted you guys to move then uh to the midwest well my father being a minister um you know we moved 
every, you know, eight, nine years. So, yes, Seattle to uh, Northfield, Illinois, um, just north of Chicago, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> was there until sixth grade. And then so in 1973, moved to the Quad Cities, moved to Moline. Okay. And, um, you know, I didn't know you during those early years, but I suspect that the beginnings of your passion for music and the creative arts probably started at an early age. Is, is that accurate? Yeah. You know, my dad bought me Ringo Starr's identical drum set when I was 10. And I, you know, <laughs> my, my dad's a minister. My grandfather's a minister. My great grandfather was a minister. Three of my father's uncles were ministers. And I just wanted to be a rock star. I just wanted to be a Beatle. Nice. I, yeah. Um, you know, in preparing for this interview, I also came across an article that said that your mom had been Miss Idaho in like 1954 or something. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really, it's such a neat story. My dad, they met at the College of Idaho. My, they're from, I have both families from Idaho. And I still have cousins there and we just love it out there. But, um, <clears throat> so my dad was a, a collegiate golf star. He was, uh, on their, on my mom and dad's honeymoon, he went to defend his Idaho state championship, kind of a regional thing. But, mm -hmm. Well, my mom, if, if I win this tournament, I'm going to turn pro. And if I lose, I'm, we're going to go to Massachusetts where I'm going to go to seminary where his father went. And he lost this tournament in a playoff. <laughs> and my mom, so who God's... Just, <laughs> yeah, my mom, who had just been in the Miss America pageant and her roommate was Lee Merriweather, who was Miss California, who won Miss America. Right. And my mom was just this great singer and wanted to be an actress and, you know, and all of a sudden she became <laughs> uh, a little minister's wife, you know, country minister's right. wife. And uh, interesting, you know, very interesting. That, that is interesting. And it's funny because you mentioned Lee Merriweather, who, by the way, is was one of my favorite uh, actors to portray Catwoman. Um, mm. So... <laughs> Um, so you, I, I, I think I read that uh, that she and your mom, she, or she and the family anyway, uh, remained friends after that uh, Miss America pageant. It's true, yeah. For many years, we'd visit yeah. Hollywood and her, and um, like Art Carney. There's a picture of Art Carney holding me as a young nice. young lad, which which I love. I think it's great. So how'd that come? About? I mean, I, I'm a huge Art Carney fan. How'd that come about? We just went to some party with Lee Merriweather. <laughs> <laughs> it's who you know, right? <laughs> it's who you know. That's Don't crazy. You, bro. <laughs> right. So so we fast forward. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, you moved to the Quad Cities, and your dad um, was, was a minister at uh, First Congregational. Is that right? Exactly. In Church. Morning, yeah. Okay. How's he doing, by the way? He's good. You know, um, he shot his age in golf about five years ago. Really? You know, 78. And then that next winter, he just had terrible back pain and sciatica, and they talked him into a surgery that that didn't work, and it had severe nerve damage. And um, so he hasn't played golf since, um, and he hobbles to get around, but his spirit's great. Well, it's He's been a lot of – yeah, it's been a lot of years uh, since I've seen him, but uh, – uh, I always remember him as a great guy. By the way, you know, I, if I, I, I would have to be 150 or so to shoot my age. So, uh, um, so uh, having having grown up with a with a, a minister as a father, what was that like? You mentioned that it was obviously something that was in the family for generations, um, and of course, I know you as as a wild child too. Um, and, uh, like you said, wanting to be the rock star, what was that like for you growing up? Yeah. Um, it's a great question and it's, it's, it's very deep. I think, you know, for all of us, I think the greatest question we can ask ourselves is, 
you know, wh- is there a God, you know, is, wh- what is that relationship to you? You know, and it's so mm-hmm. personal and, you know, it was never forced on me or m- my parents were just so loving and supportive and, um, you know, all my life, people told me how much they loved my father and they little old ladies would pinch my cheek and say, are you going to be a minister <laughs> like your father? And I was like, uh, no, Mm-mm. I mean, it just wasn't on the radar at all. Yeah. Yeah. Strange. It's kind of strange, but I had my, I've just always known what I wanted to do. You know, I just always have my record collection. I was just so immersed into music and just wanted to learn everything I could about, you know, how do you write a song? I mean, that was, my dad tells a story when I was, you know, I don't know, eight or nine. He, he knows it was before, he knows before I was 10 that, that I'd started, I'd wanted to write songs. Mm-hmm. So that's, and well, he was totally well, well, supportive and, and he gets that, you know, you're given your free will and you can do whatever you want with it. Well, and you know, there are, uh, there's a whole litany of uh, musicians and performers out there who have come from that kind of background where they've they've had uh, parents who were in the ministry um, and are involved. And, and I know that you also also have a background with the, you know, the church choir, which also seems to be something you hear a lot. Um, so I think there there might be some kind of correlation between that background in music. Um, not that I've ever heard you do any, and I know you've been involved in a lot of different genres of music. I don't know that I've ever heard you do gospel, but I know you did do some Christian rock for a while. Um, what, how do you think, uh, you know, the, that, that background has had impacted you as far as your, your musical inclinations or tastes? Yeah, it's another really good question because I used to think they were two separate things or you kind of had to be in one world or the other. Now I just believe all music is worship. It's such a, it's such a, um, it's such a gift, you know, this gift of mm-hmm. music. I mean, music is just what emotions sound like. And, and you can be, <laughs> I don't care. And my dad didn't care. I mean, he, when he came backstage at Van Halen and, you know, Alex Van Halen came over to him with the Jack Daniels bottle, my dad hit that hard, <laughs> you know, and he was like, oh, my gosh, this is awesome. You guys are you guys are really good. That's you know, cool. So, I... Yeah. So at this point, it's all it's just all good, you know. Yeah. And I can definitely see your dad doing that. That's that's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, so, so besides your uh, your ch- your church roots, like the uh, the church choir, for instance, um, what's the first time that you started performing seriously? And and I'm not talking about the writing or because I do want to get into that and talk about that process, but but actually performing. Yeah, well, um, so in Moline. Junior high, um, my first band was called Mazo, which in, in Spanish is crazy. And so it was <laughs> Matt enough. Hunter and Tony Delio, and Tony's dad was the our band director at uh, Coolidge Junior High, mm-hmm. and uh, and Tom Hunter on trumpet. And I'll never forget we played some backyard party in Moline, and he's got paid seventy five bucks, you know, and we were playing like. When the Saints go marching in, and <laughs> Pinball Wizard, and and you know I was drumming and singing, and Matt Hunter was on mm-hmm. keyboards, and, and we sang, and that was it. I was just that You're was hooked. Hooked. yeah. And I don't know how long that lasted, but soon after that, you know, I met Greg Hayes, right? Hayes, the bass player from Dick Holiday and the Bamboo Gang, and we started Nightfall with, you know. Kathy Caparula and uh, Jim Van Winkle and, and Steve right. Hayes. And, right, and, and Jim Caparula. And Jim, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that was, for me, that was just incredible. That was just awesome. And we were, <laughs> we were in high school making a great living. 
I yeah, mean, for sure. Weddings, you know, the arsenal, we play the arsenal once or twice a month, you know, the officer's headquarters, the, their bar. But that was awesome. I mean, playing Kathy was Linda Ronstead, you know. For sure, for sure. For and that was serious. That was serious. And, and of course, a lot of listeners will recognize some of those names. Um, Kathy, um, who was Hollenbeck at the time and Caparula now, uh, has has been a longtime fixture in the Quad Cities music scene. I think Jim Van Winkle as well. Um, um, and, of course, as you mentioned, Greg, uh, also known as Clem, has continued on professionally. Uh, uh, so that obviously there was a lot of talent in that in that band back then, and it, it carried on. And you guys played uh, into, into college for a while. I, I remember, I don't know if you'll remember this, but uh, you and I, well, you roomed with me and Cap and uh, – Scott Kokite and Dan Anderson and Pat Hayes and a bunch of us for a while. And it, I think the only ones that were on the lease were Jim and I, but I think we had like six, six or seven people living in a, a three bed or two bedroom apartment for a while, which was just <laughs> nuts. Um, and I, I only mentioned that because I thought we had some pretty wild times back then, but I'm sure that those, those episodes are pretty tame compared to what you probably went through with uh, Van Halen and beyond. Um, so, so, so I definitely like good legwork, though. Good, you know, good work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You um, I also <laughs> now I also remember a stint you did with a jazz band called Birdland. Yeah, was was but... that before or after you went to Hollywood? Just before. Just before, and that was pr pretty brief. Yeah, 80, 81. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with Dwayne uh, Isaacson and Steel Helier. That's right, yeah. On bass, and um, yeah, that was fun, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 again, some great musicians, some great music, uh, and always, you know, fun to watch it. Um, but then you went, you went to Hollywood, to uh, the Musicians Institute of Technology? Yeah. So I told my dad, I'm going, you know, you can take me or I'm going. And he <laughs> took me and then, and, and then Clem said, well, I'm going too, you know? And so we moved out there together. It was great. T tell us about that. I mean, what was that experience like? I, I remember either hearing or reading that you guys had access to some great t teachers like uh, Frank Zappa, uh, the band, band Toto yeah. and others. Yeah. Yeah, uh, do the they actually run play. courses or, or how'd that work? Yeah, so it was a year long school. And so there, it's called Musicians Institute, MI. And then there's GIT, Guitar Institute of Technology, BIT, bass, and bass. PIT, percussion. So I went mm -hmm. to PIT, Clem went to the bass institute. BIT. And then mm -hmm. there we met Grant Ty, who's the guitar player for Dick Holiday and the Bamboo Gang. Mm -hmm. He's going to GIT, and it, so it's just like a crash course, uh, a one-year study taught by uh, Hollywood session musicians. You know, just just the, the best, top, of the best, the best of the best, and it was awesome. It was yeah. Incredible at that now, time. in in addition to to you know learning your craft and and fine tuning, you know, with the help of of these kinds of great teachers did did it um help you as far as making connections within the industry at all or at, or even teach you about the industry at all or, or were you kind of left flailing in the wind as far as that portion um, of the, you know yeah it's a good question because the school is so focused on you know teaching you just just super accelerated you know drums and and then so every day different you know like the drummer from weather report you know alex mm -hmm. acuna and um percussionist and the, you know ed thigpen this old black jazz drummer that just filleted me open this guy changed my life you know the way he approached you know drums and music and feel and man you know where you know where where is it just talking about where you're hitting the snare drum where you at, mm -hmm. man? You know, are you on top? Are you wet? Are you fat? Are you, you know, what you're driving? Mm -mm. 
you're driving. And he's looking at me and I'm like, but don't hit me. <laughs> but I loved this guy, you know, just little things like that, that just really changed my life. You know, my approach, not to mention the guys from Toto and, and Jeff Picaro, their drummer, you know, was at that time was just an absolute hero. And I, I auditioned for his dad who wrote the curriculum for the PIT mm. school and along with Ralph Humphreys, the drummer from Frank Zappa. You know, by the way, uh, for for those of us who are not percussionists or uh, very musically inclined, that description of what he was telling you sounded more like uh, somebody having sex than anything else. So, <laughs> well, it was. I guess, yeah. <laughs> it's orgasmic in a, in a sense, right? Uh, well, and that's my point. This guy was like nothing I'd ever heard before, you know. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. You know, and then I guess it was shortly after that that you started with Van Halen, right? Well, right. So uh, the first semester of that school was great. And I came home from Christmas and by, and I brought one of our neighbors at our little apartment complex in Hollywood was this guy, Frank Gambali, who's gone on to be world class guitarist. Uh, he, he played for Chick Corea, you know, for 30 years. And this mm-hmm. guy was from Australia. And he didn't have any family really to go home to, or he so he came back to Moline with me for Christmas and sat in with the Birdland band. We did a gig. Nice. I'll never forget that. And Frank was just blowing everybody away. Um, so then I go back to the next semester, and my first day of the new class, there's this new drummer in our class, this big old boy, uh, and he's got this red. Uh, Van Halen diver down tour jacket on and it says Ron and I go hey Ron nice jacket and he goes hey F you man you want to go to a party and I go yeah I'll go to a party and I was all about the party those days um, Sure. well it was Alex Van Halen's bachelor party on a 60 foot yacht off of Santa Monica complete oh. with midgets and strippers so the 50, oh. 50 guys on the crew on this huge yacht you know, just cruising out into the night. Uh, and it was just incredible. So the management team and the band was up in the front. There was a glass room before you stepped out onto the bow with tables and a bar and just catered to the nines and everything. Mm-hmm. And I'm just pouring drinks for the management and got introduced and everything. And, and like, you know, halfway through the night, the tour manager, Harvey Shapps goes, Hey, Brad, what are you doing the next couple of years? <laughs> I said, why? Nice. Are we getting married? Or? <laughs> <laughs> That's a little forward, but I'm open. So, yeah, I got hired as his, his assistant. So, next so thing what I did knew, you? yeah, I, well, my first gig with them was the Us Festival. Oh, wow. So, 300,000 people out in the San Fernando Valley, you know, mm-hmm. four days of unbelievable concerts it's did, crazy. Did, did you even finish up the semester then or did you just you know, start I, right away I with them think so i kind of mm-hmm. did but i think i phased out i think um you know all of a sudden i'm making a grand a week yeah 33 bucks a day per diem you know right at 20, right. Well, at 21 years old you know 22 for sure yeah so i was off i was done that was it so what what was your actual job as assistant tour manager? What what were your responsibilities? Yeah, so reconfirming hotel rooms down the you know the next town or you know limos and and air, airplanes or um, but then the biggest thing was the dressing room. I was in charge of the catering, so there, you know, six seven page rider a list of everything they needed <laughs> mm-hmm. backstage. Well, you, you hear about some of those lists from other celebrities. Yeah. What were some of the kind of the, the oddities that they had on their list? 72 lint free towels. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then of course the five pounds of M and M's, no brown ones. Yeah, of course. And you know, the reason, and that's all Dave Roth, you know, and, and like, when Rolling Stone or Time Magazine or Look would, would come out, you know, he would mm-hmm. quadruple everything backstage. I mean, Dave was just all about 
the show, you know. Right, right. Uh, and he and when a big publication would come out, he'd have his Danny and Jimmy, his two midget actors from Hollywood, dress in karate geese, you know, and follow him. It's crazy. Yeah. Now, um, and we're talking just uh, so people are clear. We're talking about David Lee Roth, who was yeah. uh, the, the lead singer back then. Um, and right. probably for the, the duration of, of your work yeah, with, uh, with them. Tour, yeah. I, I saw them have an argument at the end of that tour and they kind of broke up. Yeah. Um, so, and so who was in charge of getting the groupies? Um, everybody, the roadies. <laughs> yeah. Dudes. Yeah. 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 That had to have, party. that, that had to have been a crazy time. Um, what's, what's some of the more, well, as, as an attorney, I'll tell you the statute of limitations has expired, <laughs> so you won't get in any trouble. So what's some of the craziest stuff <laughs> that uh, happened here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it was just always, um, you know, Alex Van Halen was such a prankster. You know, he's just one of those guys that was constantly, you know, playing trick, you know, just, but then he would just, he would grab a bellhop and just whip out a roll of duct tape and duct tape him to his luggage rack, pull out a can of lighter fluid, light his shoes on fire, stick a couple hundred dollar bills in his mouth and roll him into a fountain. Oh my God. So and then and then he was off to the next and and Alex, you know, he just he partied so hard, you know. I mean, no drugs. Alex was just like Schlitz malt liquor and you know, <laughs> Dram wow. and you know, just Winston's and he was just such a a, a blast, you know what I mean? He was such a yeah. party. He was either it was he was either up or he was asleep, you know. <laughs> so so, that's so what, yeah. And that went on for how long were you with uh, Van Halen? That was like a year and a half. Year and a half. Did yeah. you go directly from from Van Halen then on to um, Hall and Oates? Yeah. yeah. So the head of security for Van Halen, Eddie Anderson, who was basically Dave Roth's bodyguard. Um, after that '84 tour, they did a, a quick stint in Europe, and then back, and then Dave went to Nepal. He wanted to climb Mount Everest. Of course and he did. Eddie, <laughs> Eddie was already writing the next album, you know, and they had had a bump, a riff, and there's just like, okay, everybody's going to take some time here. Mm -hmm. So Eddie Anderson said, hey, Brad, I just got a call from Tommy Mottola, who manages Hall & Oates and Billy Joel, you know, and John Mellencamp. He's a cool dude in New York. Would you care to fly out there? And we just, we'll go have a, a meeting with them and, and see what's up. So fly into New York and um, into this coolest office on Central Park West, Champion Entertainment. And Tommy Mottola, who went on to be president of Sony US, uh, he's this cool Italian dude, hey, you know, and he's got these, <laughs> you know, beautiful secretaries, two floors, a spiral staircase up between the floors on this high rise in, in New York City. And he wants us to be, you know, to help their own John with, uh, with mm -hmm. their year and a half tour, you know, it's kind of like kind of the norm. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so was that the same type of role then when you took that on? Yeah. Although that was so mellow, you know, it was just so cool. <laughs> that was just really, uh, music, you know, and, and mm -hmm. G.E. Smith on guitar and T-Bone Wolk on bass, who went on to Saturday Night Live to, to run that band. Sure. And then Mickey Curry on drums, who Mickey now plays with Brian Adams, has for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. But the, we called them the lads, and I got to just hang with those guys. Mm -hmm. Not that John Oates and I didn't play tennis on nights off. So it went yeah. from truly, you know, throwing the TV out the, the window, staying in Holiday Inns, and and there were just so many people around, you know, constantly wanting to get to Eddie Van Halen and David Lee Roth, and it was just, it was yeah. chaos, you know. All of a sudden, <laughs> uh, I'm just, you know, in white Rolls Royce limousines with red plush carpet, you know, and I got a raise, and you know what I mean? It, it was sure. like New York City. I mean, you went out at midnight. 
Mm -hmm. and to these clubs where, I mean, this one was called the toilet. I think it was Upper East Side. And we roll up into kind of an industrial, I was like, really? This is, are we getting out here? You know, (laughs) and we went up to this factory door, you know, and boom, 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 knock. And they, we went in this freight elevator, those freight elevators that open, you know, horizontally. Sure. Yeah. And we get, and we go down about five floors and we, it opens up to this white leather boothed nightclub that's packed with a full, you know, 18 piece jazz band, just wailing. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? It was just every night was crazy. And then Tommy Mottola had the penthouse at the Mayflower hotel on central park West. And in that penthouse was a piano. And then that was, that was the hang. And Brian Doyle was the tour manager. We called that penthouse Shea Doyle. (laughs) <laughs> we'll meet you with Shea Doyle tonight, you know, a night off or even after a gig. And you just never knew who was going to come to that party. I mean, Jack Nicholson, Joan Rivers, Gene Hackman, Julian Lennon, Tom Waits, who I loved at the time. Um, so, the, yeah, that took it up a notch. You know, that was like serious Manhattan. I love yeah. music. <laughs> so so it, it it seems as though Hall and Oates had like a higher class of fandom or or, or an audience um uh than uh than Van Halen. Is that is that about uh does that sum it up? Yeah. It was yeah. the next you know, it was instead of teens and twenties and thirties, you know, it was <laughs> right it was still some twenty, but I mean you those forty and and 50 year olds that was just really laid back and fun and, and yeah. you could just relax a little bit. Yeah. Did you have a preference as to which environment you, you could, because of, you know, you're still a 20 year old back at that point. So yeah. I, I could imagine you're having a good time with the Van Halen crowd as well. Uh, did you have yeah. a preference? Uh, that's a really good question. I, you know, I look at them equally, truly, you mm-hmm. know, I think, I think it, it was a bit of a relief because I'll never forget the first Van Halen show. Um, we all flew to Jacksonville, Florida, and the first little arena show it was general admission. You know, when that curtain dropped and 16 spotlights on Eddie playing the intro to Unchained. <laughs> and Dave doing the splits off the drum riser. And when he landed and the three of them came to the front, you know, with their arms raised and the crush yeah. of people, I mean, I thought somebody was going to die. I, yeah. I, I'll never forget, like, oh, my gosh, and the sh- the stage was shaking. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've been in rehearsals at in Hollywood at Zotrope Studios, you know, Francis Ford Coppola's movie lot, you know, having martinis at, <laughs> at five club hills, you know, talking about what song is going to go next. And when that, that really, that shook me. And that was like, oh my gosh, it's on, you know. <laughs> you know, I was going to ask you, with that, I mean, as a performer yourself and a musician, uh, when you saw that happening and, and then, you know, later on when you were with, uh, touring with Hall & Oates, did that get, give you more of a bug or did that bug you more than anything? The fact that, hey, what do they got that I don't have? Why is that not me out there? I mean, what was your mindset during all that? Man, that is a great observation because I truly, I, I, I watched David Lee Roth every night. And, you know, he pretty much did the same. It was the same show every night. But sure. I learned, you know, what a showman is. I learned, do you, you know, do you just, you pause and you stick out your hand and put one hand, the other hand to your ear. And you're like, mm-hmm. And you're looking back at Alex, like, can you believe this crowd? You know, oh my gosh. You know, yeah. I think Raleigh, North Carolina is an excellent place to take your clothes off. <laughs> and yeah. and so you're right. I mean, Denny, I was like, wait a minute, you know, I can do that. Right. <laughs> that and you did. <laughs> and you absolutely well, did. I, I mean I went Yeah. We went yeah, and, and of course, and I want to get into that in in a second here because um uh, 
uh, you know, again, it's I, I've mentioned this in other podcasts before, but it's fun. It's both fun and intimidating to interview a friend that, you know, and you share a history with because you try you're trying to ask questions that, you know, I don't already know the answers to. But of course, a lot of the folks that are listening may not know any of, uh, of the answers to any of these questions. So, right. um, you know, I, 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 I you went from. From this environment and, you know, the highest rungs of, of you know, that that in entertainment um, mecca um, then decided to do go it alone. Now, was this because, hey, you, it, it, it had run its course in your mind? Did you have other opportunities to continue on and tour with anybody else or go back to Van Halen or stick with with uh, Hall and Oates or go elsewhere? Or did you just decide after watching all that? I can do this. I'm going to do this. Yeah. Another great question because halfway through that Hall and Oates tour, I can remember calling Clem from the Mayflower hotel and saying, let's get Grant, you know, I'm flying you guys. Cause by this time I had the cash and the connections and we're going to make it. Cause we'd, mm-hmm. we'd, we'd already started to write and, and goof around with, you know, different ideas in Hollywood, Grant and Clem and I, and, um, so yeah, mm-hmm. really good question because it was all all planned. Let me finish this tour. Let's meet in Chicago. Let's get it going. And then right. oh, you know one night we're like, and then so Greg Marsh, the drummer who I went to first grade with in Northfield, Illinois, mm-hmm. uh, you know one of my best friends since first grade. We went to drum lessons together in third grade. Mm-hmm. So we we got the four of us together and like ah oh, we need. A, keyboard player what do we need you know um and what are we going to call it right so you know my my dad's name is dick he's a minister and my middle name is richard dick and my dad after the second time he picked me up from jail he's like hey you know not every (laughs) day is a holiday buddy and i'm like well i beg to differ your excellency (laughs) and so it was almost like a a half drunken joke this dick holiday and then clem said oh the bamboo gang that's a mafia hit squad I'm like, oh, that's brilliant. Done. You know, so that's we just came up with that and went for it. You know, and I, I, of course, maybe it gets twisted in the telling because uh, I recall hearing that the the name Dick Holiday came from um, naming it sort of after your dad, Dick Holy Day, being a, you know, right. a minister. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, now that you mentioned that, I kind of remember that story that you just that you said about getting hauled out of jail for the second time. <laughs> we'll leave that alone. We won't we won't get into that. But <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> so, so so then um, you, you get started. That was about what, 1985 that uh, Dick Holiday gets started. Yeah, late eighty five into eighty six. Yeah. Oh, okay. And though for those folks who haven't heard Dick Holiday, um, I'd like you to describe what the what the music was. What 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 was the style and where did it come from? Yeah. So we loved um, rhythm and blues. You know, we loved um, Stevie Ray Vaughan. We loved you know Texas Roadhouse rock and roll meets, you know, Jimmy Buffett. And <laughs> we weren't sure. We were like, man, let's just, and, and I, and we consciously like, let's just plug in, you know, let's just get together and plug in and, and see what comes. And Clem is very rhythmical as a bass player. You know, his thumbs, his hands are just huge. And so we would just try and hop on a groove. I think we were kind of groove oriented and um, we loved reggae, you know, Bob Marley and third world. Mm-hmm. You remember, you remember that song, try Ja love. Right. Try. Yeah. Yeah. Try Ja love. So we love that stuff and Marvin Gaye. And um, so, it, you know, we loved where we were going. And then we started shopping into record companies and they're like, what the heck are you guys? You know? Right. So it became an issue. Yeah. Well, and I've all, you know, when people ask me what kind of music it is and I, I probably oversimplified it, but I always refer to it as Caribbean rock. 
mm-hmm. um, which wasn't simply the 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 genre or the uh, the sound necessarily of the music. Some some of the music, but um, the style of the show. I mean, you wearing a Panama hat and you know shorts and whatever it just had that island feel and flair and uh and made i think the audience feel that way as well like hey we're on we're on a vacation on a dreadlock holiday right i yeah. mean uh which uh, uh you know again you had some a great mix too of originals and covers that you that you performed um so as far as the original music um who 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 was responsible for that? Was it a collaboration? Did some guys write some of the music? Some guys write the lyrics? Did you collaborate on music and lyrics? How did that go down? Yeah, big collaboration with Dick Holiday, big time. And yeah. again, I think we love to just let's just get together, you know, because somebody will jump on something, you know, and it's just so fun when when good players just plug in, you know that. That mm-hmm. story of the Eagles, you know, and Joe Walsh plugging in for a rehearsal one night and playing that doodle little down, doodle down, down, doodle little down, down, you know. Yeah. Like, you know, right. like, what's that? That's how it's done, you know. Yeah. That's it. Somebody brings a spark. So, what would you uh, consider your favorite Dick Holiday collaborations or, or songs altogether? Um, and let me tell you, before you answer that question, the reason I'm asking it is with your permission, I'm going to ask Justin, our producer, to insert a little bit of some of the, the music into the podcast here. Sure. So what would you like folks to hear? You know, I just, uh, I think initially we wrote Dive Right In. I think mm-hmm. that's very um, telling appropriate. Of, a telling of the time how that was one of our first, you know, it was like, I'm about to dive right in, you know, see what it takes mm-hmm. to sink or swim. It was like, mm-hmm. that was kind of us, you know.
and you and you guys did put out four albums um and before you broke up in 94 um and during that time as i mentioned in the intro you had uh you know well, frankly you were one of the hottest bands in the midwest um you had been selected as uh Best local performer by the Chicago Tribune in 1990. Um, you'd had the contract with A&M Records, that sponsorship with Miller. You were touring and doing all those shows. So, so what happened? What 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 prompted the breakup? And by the way, I know I know the answers to these questions, but again, some of the folks may not. Yeah. So, um, it was interesting because, you know, you, you mentioned A&M Records we got signed to a, a development deal. And so they, you know, they um, give you money to go back in the studio and they own the masters, you know, of what you create and they get first right of refusal and, and to take, you know, to take it to the next level. And at the same time, like I mentioned, they're saying, well, what are you guys, you know? Mm -hmm. And even with Miller Genuine Draft, when they're, coming up with our promotional posters and everything. And they're like, well, what are you guys? And they're like, well, we're pumped up funk rock. So they went with that, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you're writing for a big machine, like A&M records and there's pressure, you know, there's like, you get a little window here, you get a shot, right? So the initial spark of three or four buds getting together and plugging in in high school or college, you know, and everybody can play and you can, you can, you want to write and everybody's on the same page and okay, let's go. What happens when you get a big A&R guy, an artist and relation guy from A&M Records, right? Whose butt's on the line for you guys, right? He's going mm. back to the boardroom and, you know, <laughs> he's either going to champion you, hoping that this makes his career or he's going to, you know what I mean? So sure. all of a sudden he's telling us, you need to be this, you need to be that, you need to be that. So all of a sudden the, you know, the initial creativity changed, you know, that whole dynamic changed mm -hmm. and, you know, it's hats off, it's kudos to those bands that have, have made it because man, you gotta just, <laughs> you really gotta get serious about songwriting. Right, right. Well, and I'm gonna. I want to explore some other aspects of that, but before I do, I do want to bring up the, the, you know, the fact that, you know, and I, I understand the pressure that an A and R guy is gonna have, and, and that you guys would have under the circumstances. But you were crushing it as far as bringing in the crowds to the venues you were playing, and you were sharing the bill with a crazy variety of performers, uh, Alice Cooper, um, Tammy Wynette. Mel Torme, what I mean, what the hell is that? Mel Torme, how, how does that come? Yeah, how does that come around when you you know you talk heavy metal and country, and then you know this old style crooner? How how does that happen? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We would just you know we would just we would play anywhere, any place, anytime for anybody. It's just it's just how it went. Mm -hmm. You know, doing two hundred shows a year for Miller was that was That'd a lot. And I think when you say what happened, you know, it was a combination of years. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you get dropped by A and M and then uh genuine draft that, that, that band network, cause they signed five bands a year to that. And mm -hmm. I think we did three or four years with them. Um, probably three, I think. And then, that went away. And then we were kind of just dangling, you know, we we're like, mm -hmm. and in the meantime, I gotta, I gotta tell you, you know, my biggest influences growing up besides the Beatles, you know, were the, in, in high school were Jackson Brown, James right. Taylor, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and, you know, I loved Linda Ronstead. I, I love that stuff. Still, still to this day, that's kind of my, you know, that you go to with, with some R and B, set in there, you know, with some groove. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to kind of, and I, and when I wasn't with the, the Dick Holiday guys, I I'd write, it was a different style, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was well, just kind of a natural thing, you know? 
Yeah, and and you know, and I obviously being on the road um, as much as you were in in uh, you know, like I mentioned, you know, just from my experience, you guys had tons of of fans, including a large number of groupies. You might not remember this. This is to me was was pretty funny. Um, I happened. Uh, I was living in Chicago uh, at the time that you guys were playing a lot in Chicago and I just happened to be in the neighborhood of the cubby bear and saw that you guys were playing. So I came in and, uh, <laughs> and it was packed and you were on the stage and, you know, caught my eye and, you know, whatever. And you emotioned me at the, at the break to go to whatever green room or whatever it was that you had. And you, I remember there being like some huge bouncer there, you know, waving me in. And I, and I, I think I might've had a lanyard or something too. And I go back to where you guys were taking a break and I, I know it wasn't this, but it appeared as though you were sitting on a throne <laughs> with these like women draped all over you. And I'm just like, wow. <laughs> yeah. <Come>. Right. <laughs> exactly. No, uh, no, no, no. But, but I'm thinking, man, these guys have made it. Um, <laughs> but obviously, you know, th that stuff comes with a price as far, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the party and then I know that the partying got to be a bit much as well. How, how did you deal with those types of struggles? Uh, you know, and, and did that did those things co contribute to any of the problems is, that led to you guys disbanding? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's on me and I've made amends to the guys. But, I, you know, I took that Van Halen blueprint. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. And, you know, and ran with that for for many years. And you get married and have two little boys. And, you know, that just doesn't work. That's just sure. I wasn't a healthy person, you know. Right. Right. I just wasn't. And, um, you know, June 7th, 2003, Dennis, it took me until 2003, you know, yeah. to just have that. Um, that clarity. Yeah, I, I had a moment, you know, it was very mm -hmm. personal and um, very spiritual for me. And, you know, mm -hmm. next week, you know, I'll have 18 years of sobriety. Yeah. And, and and that's amazing, and and God bless you for it. I I uh, you know as I mentioned, obviously in the intro, you are in the middle of a lot of amazing projects right now, and you've got great things going on. So you got past those struggles. Now, obviously, as you as you mentioned, it took a while, but um, what what was it that got you to that point in two thousand and three, where you had that sense of clarity and that spiritual. Uh, connection, knowing that this is this is where you had to be and what you needed to do to get, you know, uh, to the to the, the the pearly gate, so to speak. Yeah, well, it's a great question. It's it's all on the journey, you know. I think um, for many years, you know, I knew, uh, you know, I just loved alcohol and drugs. I just <laughs> I love them. I'd, I'd still be doing them if it if I wasn't going to kill me, you know, or sure, sure. I just knew I wasn't healthy. I knew I, I knew I could be better, you know, but I, you know, I tried numerous times to just go to a wedding and have a couple drinks or a, gl a glass of wine or, but I've learned that I have a physical reaction, you know, combined with a mental compulsion. Right. That is alcoholism. That's my story, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I went, went to AA for, you know, I went to my first AA meeting probably about 28 years ago. Mm -hmm. you know? And then, nah, I'm okay, I'm, you know, this, it just took, it just, it just took a while to slow down from all that, you know. But I think mm -hmm. I went through a divorce and um, my family gathered around me. You know, my father laid his hand on my shoulder one time and just said, uh, it just, it just really worry about me, you know. And you can mm -hmm. keep going, but I, I don't think you want to, do you? Or, you know, you just have right. those those real personal moments. And, and I so I wanted to get healthy. You know, I really did. And it just took mm -hmm. me a while. Yeah. Well, and I, and I appreciate you sharing that. And I'm sure other people will appreciate that, too, because so many people struggle and go through that, that similar struggle. Um, and in fact, you know, within the business, there's so many performers that 
have the same problems, you know, exposure to that lifestyle and the fun and, and frolic and all that. Um, and so many of them don't get past those demons. So, you know, for people to hear that there can be light at the end of the tubul- uh, tunnel is is inspirational. So, you know, thanks for sharing that, because I know it's not something, you know, people like talking about, um, but it's it's very valuable to a lot of folks. Yeah. Um, thanks. I love know, be- talking about it today. Yeah. You know? Sure. Yeah. Looking back and knowing it's. It's in the rearview mirror. It's got to feel pretty good. Yeah. Um, you know, before I leave uh, talking about uh, Dick Holiday, I, I know uh, people would kick me in the whatever if I didn't ask if you guys are going to be reuniting for any uh, performances in the mid- Midwest or in the Quad Cities anytime soon. Uh, the only thing we have on the books is July 3rd up in Dora County, Wisconsin. We're playing a... Um, a resort up there for the July 4th weekend. But I I had to tell the guys at the beginning of the year, like you said, I just have all these things going on in Nashville. And meantime, my wife and I are buying a house in Naples, Florida. We're moving from Mm -hmm. Chicago to be near her mother, who's uh, all alone now. And, you know, COVID's Mm -hmm. just been hard on everybody. Right, for sure. She, She needs... We need to be near her, uh, and then I'll commute to Nashville. So I said, guys, I just need this summer. You know, it'll be hard for me to commit to numerous dates, but you know, let's try and let's try and, and do a and, couple. And, yeah. yeah, and I guess to clarify, uh, because I hear we're talking about the breakup of, of Dick Holiday in '94, but for those folks who aren't familiar, you guys do occasionally reunite and, and play occasional gigs. Um, notwithstanding what you just said about, you know, your projects uh, taking up so much time this year and COVID uh, obviously kind of backing a lot of people up in a lot of ways. Um, So the hope is, I know you still have a lot of fans of Dick Holiday that would like to catch you guys sometime in the future, but not, I will personally say not at the risk of any of your current projects, which I want to talk about because that, that's some really exciting stuff. And obviously, you know, music, performance, your faith, which we've touched a little bit on, those aren't your only passions. And you started to allude to it, so I want to go here a little bit. Um, after that breakup that you had with Dick Holiday in 94, you became a country club golf pro for a while. So, which... I, I know you're a great golfer, and and uh, and obviously your dad as well. But how did that come about? And I, I I understand too that you used to play with Michael Jordan. So did did you ever have to get caught up in a bet with him? You know, thousand oh, dollars a hole or whatever. Oh my gosh! So uh, I'm newly married and have a a young son, and I'm playing golf with my father in law in Florida, and. I just, you know, I don't know, shoot 75 in the wind. And he's like, I'm calling the PGA for you. You're <laughs> going to be a golf pro. And <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, and, you know, we joined when we moved to Northfield, Illinois, this country club right next to the church, the Sunset Ridge Country Club, which is just awesome, had a really sweet deal for clergy in the, in the town. And we joined this country club. And uh, so when it was time to, what, what, I said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll try it. I'll try the, the PGA, you know, let's see what happens. Mm-hmm. And so pass the playing test, you know, the, the PAT, the playing aptitude test, or you have to, for 36 holes, I think you have to be four or five over, you know, under, you know, that's your max. Mm-hmm. Um, so pass that. And then, call my buddy Tom Wilcox, the head pro at this Sunset Ridge Country Club. And I said, hey, I just passed the PAT. Do you need any, anybody? Because you have to go, you have to then work for a, a PGA head professional, you know, and do the, mm-hmm. the different years of, it's kind of like college, you know. Sure. And he was like, yeah, awesome. Bring it on. So um, went to work as a golf pro. It was pretty funny. <laughs> well, and in fact, I saw you were golfing with Henry Cho, the the comedian, not that long ago, was it? 
last week. Uh, last week. So obviously, um, you've had some some great networking opportunities on the on the the uh, golf course as well. Uh, you know, besides uh, someone like like him or uh, Michael Jordan, which yeah, you got to tell me about that. When when and how did that ever <laughs> well, happen? And so a couple times, Jordan lived not too far from Sunset Ridge Country Club, and on Mondays, mm-hmm. you know, he occasionally he would just call and. You know, he'd call it like 1030 because the course was closed and he can play anywhere he wants, you know, but this is a really sweet old school track, North sure. Chicago. So he would call and he'd bring over, he has an entourage, you know, when, when oh, he shows yeah. up um, and, and he loved to play with the pros and gamble and then mm-hmm. he'd probably have another foursome behind them, you know, and carts and um, so I got in a couple of those because he would play all day and then you'd kind of rotate players. I got in a couple of those games for nine or 18 holes. And um, it was just always so fun to be around him. The last Mm -hmm. time I played with him was the morning after his last championship. So he hits the winning shot in Utah. Mm -hmm. They get home at like four 30 in the morning. He sleeps until about 10 30 and we're just hanging out in the pro shop. Maybe, you know, who knows? He calls and uh, my buddy answers the phone. And he says, yeah, TW, MJ, balls in the air at noon, bring your wallet, your A game. <laughs> Hangs up. <laughs> he arrives with the entourage, like Quinn Buckner, Ahmad Rashad, Eric Dickerson, who has three girls on his, <laughs> in his cart, two cards for Eric. Um, just a Richard Dent, I don't know, three or four other people. And, and it's just on game on, and we play 54 holes. So here he goes, he plays the whole NBA season and the playoffs. And do you remember how those playoff games, how brutal oh, yeah. they were? for sure. Unbelievable. And he, he's playing 54 holes and I'm still drinking at the time and I'm matching him Bud Light for Bud Light. And mm-hmm. it must have been, I, you know, twelve pack easy, mm-hmm. cigars and gambling and trash talk. You've never heard. I've never heard <laughs> better trash talk from anybody. Nobody comes close. Yeah, that's what I've heard. And what was so cool was like the second or third green, he's putting for birdie, and his phone rings. And this is, you know, nobody has cell phones then. Mm-hmm. And he he puts and he he lips out. He taps in and answers his phone. Better be good. He goes, hey, what up, dog? And he walks off the green, and we putt out, and we meet him over on the next team. He's like, all right, man. All right, I'll see you there. Bring your wallet, your A game. He hangs up, and he turns to us, and he goes, hey, Tiger Woods says hi, everybody. (laughs) And that's how the day started. You know, it was just like, oh, my gosh. And then we started busting his chops. We're like, you can't just call Janet Jackson. You can't just call him. (laughs) And he goes, yeah, JJ, it's MJ. <laughs> you know, baby. And it was, it was unbelievable. Cool. And he's like, he wouldn't sign anything all day. He's like, Mm-mm, this is my day. But he's taking pictures. So I called my wife at the time and had, had her dress our little boys up, you know, who were five and two in their mm-hmm. Bulls uniforms and meet us at the turn. We've got a great picture with him. Wow. Yeah, yeah like I said... Things. Like I said to to the audience, uh, you know, I, I I think that I've had a pretty interesting um, uh, journey in my lifetime. But this guy, he's been he's been with them all. Um, now you, you you mentioned your boys, and and so I know in between, you know, uh, where you're at now, and and you know the time that we're talking about, you had you had the two boys, and now you're married to Jane. Um, tell tell me a little bit about you know what the what family means to you. I mean, obviously you grew up in a close family setting. How has that yeah. translated in in uh, your family? Yeah, it's everything now. You know, I think when you're young and laser focused on things, and I had you know my spirituality was Bob Marley. It's kind of a joint and a red stripe, and hey man, you know everything I read and. Mm-hmm. party up but I didn't have any I, I couldn't quiet myself you know I could never be still and just mm-hmm. hang 
with family and enjoy, and just enjoy family, you know? I mean, my sister would, she'd be like, you just be, you'd come in for Thanksgiving <laughs> and then, then you'd be off. Off you go. Yeah. Off you go. Gotta go. And now I don't, now I don't go, mm -hmm. you know? So it, family to me means so much because I see now how I, you know, I was, I was hurtful back then, you know, cause I, yeah. I wasn't there for anybody. I wasn't, I don't, not that I didn't care. I love my family, but I wasn't there, you know? Sure. Sure. So, you know, and my wife now, Jane and I, we dated in our twenties. I, I loved her, but I was just a ping pong ball. I was all over the, you know, it was just, and I was, I've always been a serial monogamist. I was, I'm grateful. I learned that about myself is that my issue was just kind of <laughs> mm -hmm. self, you know, I think any life focused on self today can hardly be, you know, a success. Sure. Now, you know, and I, as I mentioned, I do, I'm kind of going through this chronologically and I don't really mean that by uh, intentionally, but it just kind of is unfolding that way. I know um, that you also had a couple stints uh, the Brad and I band, which I think was a kind of a Christian rock band. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. And then um, also Brad and I and the Western philosophers, which I remember that name, but I didn't really, it didn't really click until I, I actually, I talked to our friend Scott who went yeah. down to, to visit you recently yeah. and he had mentioned Cheyenne, the movie I want to talk about. Yeah. And so I was listening to the song Cheyenne that, that, uh, that you wrote mm -hmm. and I believe performed with the Western philosophers. Is, is that accurate? Well, it's actually the bamboo gang. Oh, it, it was. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I just, I started, you know, right after June 7th, 2003, um, I had a, a spiritual awakening, you know, mm -hmm. truly. So June, July, and I'm just, everything's different. And, and I knew it. And people who knew me knew it. And there was a, it was gone. I was just kind of delivered, you know, from my personal darkness, you know. So August that summer, 2003, um, I said, and, and I'm writing, I've got a new song on my heart, you know, <laughs> it's new. And mm -hmm. for me, Benny, you know, it was, it was Jesus. It was Jesus the Christ, because when you're the son of a minister and you don't believe, then, then you don't believe. Right. And my mm -hmm. dad was just like, well, it's, it's, you've got to <laughs> come to your truth. Mm -hmm. Right. And so just having that freedom and having, having it took what it took. So, you know, to be very personal, you know, I woke up on June 7th, 2003, extremely hungover. You know, this pinky was sideways, was broken. I didn't know where my car was. Uh, I was going through a divorce, living alone in a little apartment in the north, north of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And, and I prayed. And I said, if you are who you say you are, you know, reveal yourself to me. And Shortly after that, there was a knock at the door and it was my mother dressed to the nines because I thought you were going to say dressed as Jesus. That would have blown me away. <laughs> well, same thing. Yeah, okay. um, she was dressed to take me to this wedding that I was performing at that night. That was, that was going to be, you know, anything you wanted there. Right. Sure. Um, <clears throat> and she took me to that. I got through that night. Just, I can't believe I got through that night, you know, without a drink mm -hmm. and especially being hung over, you know, because normally right. the old Brad would be, you know, the dog. you're going to take two to, to cure you, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just to get her back to equal. Anyway, it just started this whole new life. So August of 2003, I decided, okay, I'm going out to Colorado because I loved Colorado. I just always go to Colorado. I'm going to go sit up on a mountain and sit up on the continental divide. And I'm going to write 50 songs. And, you know, this is just going to be awesome. So I go out for a week and I sit up on, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to drink water and eat grubs right from under a rock. 
Right. So I go out and sit on top of the Continental Divide for a week under the stars. Just unbelievable. Just alone. I, I highly recommend that. Mm-hmm. Go camping in Colorado under the stars, you know, and just <laughs> let let the let your, your batteries and your flashlight run out, you know, mm-hmm. and be scared to death of the nearest twig over sure. <laughs> in the darkness. Yeah, yeah. Race it, man. It's unbelievable. So I sit up on on a mountain for a week and I don't write one song, but I come down and instead of going down into Denver and then up 76 to hit 80, I decided I'm going to take 25 and go up to Cheyenne and cut East on 80 head home time to be a sober single dad for the first time. Divorce was done. Right. Everything was like, it was like, it's weird how the timing worked. It's this whole new chapter. So I, I drive north up into Cheyenne. It's this beautiful, sunny summer day. I hit 80 and turn right, turn east back to Chicago and drive into a tornado. I mean, a tornadic. Mm-hmm. Every, everybody's pulled off to the side of the road. And all of a sudden, the song chorus comes, you know, do we have to go through Cheyenne? Can't we take the long way around? She'll probably find out where I am. And all of a sudden, Cheyenne became a metaphor for me. And so I get home and I had a session with the guys planned. And I said, hey, can we try this, you know? And, and it went down real quick. Just We just recorded it quickly and just kind of had it. So mm-hmm. then a couple of years go by and I'm just single. I'm just, man, like, yeah, I start the Brad and I band. I get hired as a director of contemporary worship at a church and I've got this whole new life and I'm kind of, I'm helping, I'm enjoying helping other men, you know, with this issue. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, when you come into an AA meeting on a Friday night, it's, it's not cause there's nothing good on TV. Right. It's like, you're, you're certain you're seeking, you're, you, you need some help. And so I, mm-hmm. I love being that, but then I make me Jane, I reconnect with Jane and, um, was just playing her some some songs and she was asking to hear some music and and this song Cheyenne came on and she's like, Oh my gosh, that is a movie. And I said, Well let's write it. And she had just loaded screenwriting software on her laptop and she was trying to uh, obtain the rights to this book she loved to write a screenplay. She's just always wanted to do it. And I I mm-hmm. wasn't thinking about that at all. It was on the radar. Right. Whatsoever. I love movies, but I'm just, I was like, I'm not a, no, nah, that's not me. So we wrote, we took a couple years, three or four years probably, and wrote this script. And um, in the meantime, I'd been going down to Nashville um, because, you know, I, those Idaho roots, you know, and my mom loved, my dad too, loved country music. I've always loved, you know, George Jones and, Mm-hmm. Patsy Cline and you know Johnny Cash that old school sure all that stuff because I had a cousin Delbert in Idaho who was a DJ out at the cinder block you know AM radio station out in the country you know and my other three cousins Johnny Bobby and David they all played guitars and you know and they were cowboys you know mm-hmm. bands, and they were just my heroes so I always loved that so um started, you know, writing some more and, um, you know, approached a couple of guys to, to start a, uh, production company with me, you know, or I'd go to Nashville and seek out some talent and write and produce. So I've been doing that, you know, for, for many mm-hmm. years. Um, but, uh, Jim Helene, who's a dear friend from the quad cities. I don't know if you know, Jim, his family. Uh- I know the name. I'm yeah, they sure went on the elevator. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, Jim and I went to high school, Moline High School together. Um, and he was involved with this guy in Nashville. And by the way, Jim had been praying for me for 20 years. He he came backstage, Van Halen. <laughs> and he, you know, he'd say goodnight. He's like, hang on, bro. Hang on tight, you know. Yeah, right. Um, but... You know, there was there wasn't anything in the closet about me. 
you know, except my, you know, cocaine use. I was lying to everybody about that. Right. That's a big beast. It was for me. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, after my, you know, awakening, uh, I talked to Jim. He's just thrilled. And he says, hey, you got to get down to Nashville and meet this guy, Chris Thomason. Awesome dude. So Chris is, um, he's been in the music publishing for 30 years now, but um, there were these wow worship CDs in the Christian market. There were compilations of different Christian artists and he, that was his idea. And he brought this to Integrity, the label he worked for, and they sold 40 million of those. Mm. Um, you know, the Christian market's healthy. <laughs> it's a real, yeah, thing. it's for yeah, sure. It's, it's serious. So anyway, mm. I had this relationship with Chris and, um, we would just talk a couple, three or four times a year and just say, what's up, what's going on, this and that. Finally, I present this Cheyenne idea to him and he loves it. He's just like, wow, you know, and then had some songs, Cheyenne and then a couple others. Anyway, he goes, uh, hey, my nephew just got hired as director of marketing for uh, original content at Netflix. And we need to put this together and pitch it. So we raised some quality capital and really did it right. A pitch deck, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So we've had, we had verbals right before COVID, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's it's been interesting, but even cooler, we had, um, Warner Brothers Nashville pick up the soundtrack. So, you know, it's kind of like right. they're ready when we are, you know, it's right. Like everybody, right. everybody understands right now. It's just like shut down. So sure, you know, I drop sure. all this stuff. It's not name dropping it for me. It's just like, it's networking. You know, I think we're created to help each other, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, and like you said, right up front, it's like, it's not what, you know, it's like, who do you know? You know, yeah. it's, it's all about the hang. So it's, right. it's why the golf course is such a great place to mm-hmm. do business. I mean, you can tell a lot about a guy on the golf course. Sure. If he's well, taking it, a little you know, too seriously, you know. It's like, yeah. Right. And I don't I don't think most people would would uh, accuse you of name dropping in any kind of pretentious way. I think it's it's helpful to understand how these things get accomplished. I mean, you had a series of connections that have led you down this path to now where um, you, there's some serious consideration uh, to produce, you know, a dream of yours, you know, and, and, and as you said, it was not even something that you were really looking for to, to write a movie. Right. Um, and, and by the way, and I'm not sure of this, but I, I don't know if maybe our, our friend Scott mentioned this to me or you said something, but isn't the movie at least loosely based on your life? It is. Yeah. It's, it's semi-autobiographical. It's, it's more, you know, we, um, so Chris Thomason, you know, we had a meeting and it was like, Chris, what do you need for this, you know, to, mm-hmm. to sell it, to pitch it and sell it? He said, well, I need Chris Harris producing the soundtrack, who's been in Nashville um, 35 years and produced everybody. And I need Carl Hortzman directing. And Carl is owns Triple Horse Film Studios out of Atlanta. So we met, we all went to Atlanta and Carl said, well, you know, we really need to fine tune this script. You know, we need to, um, he, and in fact, and we're all men of faith and we're all, we changed the script. We're like, let's just kind of go soft serve. You know, I mean, the guy mm-hmm. has his, his bottom and then, you know, through a song medley, we see him talking with an older man who's mentoring him maybe, or, you know what I mean? We kind of just, sure. went, we went, easy with it um so i mean it it is but we all of a sudden we just wanted to make it a star is born uh, you know country americana and really mm-hmm. just a vehicle for good songs great songs. you know just right because and that's why when we went to warner brothers they told us well you know we played them the 
the sizzle reel, you know, and had their mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And they said, well, we really dig this because we're seeing our artists music being bought, you know, directly from Netflix. Right. Or, you know, any, any streaming content, people are shazamming songs and buying them. Yeah. And it's unbelievable how this music business is fording this new stream. For sure. It's funny you say that because one of our prior podcasts, we spoke with Bo Davidson, who's a Nashville uh, singer and actor. And one of the things that we were talking about with him was the fact that uh, you, we're seeing a lot of, you know, you mentioned Netflix, but a lot of streaming movies that, you know, need music. They, they're, they're, you know, employing great writers. And specifically, he was referring to, uh, Oh, what's that? The Kevin Costner oh, vehicle on Walmart. Paramount. Uh, what was it? Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Yes, yes. So he's talking about Yellowstone and the guy who's writing the music for Yellowstone and how that's propelled him. Uh, and, and that music's being picked up outside of you know the movie industry and exactly. it's being followed by so many people. Um, and by the way, this is a good segue um, into what you're doing with, with uh, Pod Plays. Yeah. Um, before I get to that though, you, so who do you see, who do you envision as the main c character that plays the loosely based Brad Nye? Is that going to be like Brad Pitt or <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's that going to be? I wanted to talk to you. Okay, good, good. I, I'm glad we're on the same page. Um, so, so anyway, like, like, like I mentioned, we were talking um, about Pod Place, and what I love about Pod Place is the fact that you are introducing so much great music through these these family friendly plays um, that are being performed via podcast, and and I may be um, uh, really doing an injustice to a description. So I, I want you to tell us how that came about, you know, what your hopes are for that. And, you know, as we mentioned, uh, you guys skyrocketed to the top of the charts, charts essentially overnight with, with pod plays. Yeah. Thanks. So, and, and, you know, and I want to circle back to this, but kudos to you for doing this. And, and there's such power in creating content, you know, mm -hmm. podcasts, you know, writing, putting pen to paper, writing a script, you know, writing a song. It's just, it's time. Content is king right now. Yeah. And podcasts are going through the roof. So um, when we were recording the the Cheyenne soundtrack in Nashville, and which was just unbelievable because all of a sudden, now I've got this budget to hire, you know, and we're hiring <laughs> You know, Tim Akers, this guy who in his home studio, you know, he has letters and platinum records from, you know, Faith Hill and Kid Rock and mm -hmm. Keith Urban. And he's he toured with Rascal Flatts for six years, Vince Gill for eight years, Leanne Rimes. He's been, you know, it's just when you're in Nashville, when you're successful in Nashville for 40 years, you got to be the best of the best. So all of a sudden I'm hanging with these guys, you know, the bass player from Michael McDonald or, you know, Tim McGraw's lead guitar player. And, and they're just dudes, you know, obviously they're just, but they're cats, you know, they're cats that do it day in and day out and nothing impresses them, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> except maybe, you know, the new Tim McGraw number one hit, they might get it. That's pretty cool. Sure. Um, so anyway, I asked uh, our music producer, Chris Harris, I said, hey, can you get me a right with Leslie Satcher? Because this woman is royalty in Nashville. And, you know, she wrote Troubadour for George Strait. She's written 15 songs with Vince Gill, and she's written for Reba and Martina and just Willie Nelson. Mm -hmm. She's from East Texas. And I I've, I've, I've heard that she is a savant lyrically mm -hmm. anointed right so when you hear <laughs> when these legends um you know this folklore right i love this stuff so chris said yeah man let me call her let's get her right that'd be awesome you know so he sets it up and we get together we come into this little studio room and 
nice to meet you, nice to meet you, and talk a little bit, and just like, oh, I hear you, I hear your movie's going to just be great, and this and that, and this and that. Yeah, I don't know, you're from Texas, you know, you, how long you been here, just talking a little bit, and then, all right, and she started getting some guitars out, she goes, anybody got any titles? And I said, well, I got this um, Last Chance Texaco, you know, I always loved that kind of on the road and she just perked up she goes oh oh you mean like oh they're changing by the side of the road again he's betting on her and she's betting on him and the bathroom key has a hubcap chain to it and and she just Danny she just starts she just lays this song out like <laughs> crazy in 20 minutes it was done you know and I'm like I played a chord and provided a title you know I had a little vibe you know what I mean <laughs> yeah right Maybe it's here she's like oh oh yeah 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 and she's like, well, we got a little time left. Got anything else? And I said, well, I got this sad cowboy, you know. And I played this little sad cowboy rides all alone, you know, just kind of. And she's like, yeah. oh, you know, and she did it again. Yeah. Oh, like a tumbleweed tumbling with no home. And he's out. Oh, he's out. And then she, she went out like five lines. We got to get the sad cowboy choir. And then she wrote back from that. And. And I just saw how it's done, you know, how the greats, why this woman, why Vince Gill says, when you get with Leslie Satcher, you better buckle up because it's on, mm. you know, mm -hmm. and then the greats and they have the respect of the greats. Right. Right. So I go back to the hotel and I just, I'm just freaking. I'm like, Jane, I just wrote with the greatest songwriter I've ever written with hands down. And, uh, I invited him for dinner. Hope that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that night, we were going to have Chris, the music producer, and his wife, Jan, who we just made fast, dear friends with, and Leslie Satcher and her husband, David Allen. So the six of us were having a lovely dinner. I'm sitting next to David Allen, and he's uh, he looks like uh, General George Armstrong Custer. Yeah, he's right. got the handlebar mustache and ponytail and cowboy hat and this beautiful like lambskin cowboy shirt uh blonde you know shirt mm -hmm. he's just a man of few words and um but we're just having a great time and we're sitting next to each other and just kind of a lull and he he turns to me and says now no what are you doing again and i kind of explained i said well we're, we're working on this movie but i'm I'm down here, you know, I've been working with some artists, writing with younger artists and want to start a publishing company and mm -hmm. you know, this and that. And I said, what do you think about that? And he goes, so I think that's a terrible idea. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, sweet, come on. Tell me, what are you thinking? Well, he doesn't say another word for, you know, the conversation shifted over here. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we had, so we finished dinner and we go up. We're saying goodnight in the foyer of this hotel. And he goes, hey, man, you got time for breakfast in the morning? I said, yeah, come on down. So he comes down. So he goes home that night, Denny, and he's out at his pool man cave, you know, out in Leaper's Fork, Tennessee, out where all the ranches are, you know, these sprawling, gorgeous Justin Timberlake and, you know, Kid Rock and right. Kenny Chesney and. Tim and Faith, and these they're just beautiful out there. It's like the mm. Beverly Hills, you know, of, of Nashville. Sure. He's out sitting in his pool, uh, sitting by his pool. And he said the Lord downloaded this business plan to him because he's seen, he's been his wife's business manager for 25 years in Nashville. And he's seen her career, her songwriting, everything changing. And he's seen podcasts go through the roof, right? Right, right. In the last five years, about $100 million has been spent on advertising for podcasts. And in the next two, it's going to be over a billion dollars. So he, like I said, he said it was just downloaded to him and he started writing. So he came back the next morning for breakfast and he laid out this business plan. He said, this is, a, this is three LLCs. It's a podcast, it's a record label, and it's a publishing company. And we're going to turn this town on its head because we're going to put, we're going to create family-friendly stories 
and pack them with great songs written by Nashville hit songwriters. What do you think of that? And I said, I think that's a wonderful idea. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we had less than a 60 minute phone call with, with one investor friend of mine and we're off and running. Yeah. And you off and running is, is a good description. Now you got a shout out that uh, helped you spiral to the top. Um, what was that? Uh, as- Dana Perino on the five. Yeah. So Leslie, she's a huge Leslie Satcher fan. You know, she's mm-hmm. a country music. She's a country girl. Mm-hmm. And when you're immersed in that country scene, you know that Leslie is, you know, I mean, you know, Vince and Amy, Vince Gill and Amy Grant were at Leslie and David's wedding. You know, they hang with Garth and, you know, you know what I mean? It, mm-hmm. Trisha and it's like, <laughs> right. They're right. sharing recipes. So Dana Perino. So Leslie contacts Dana and just asks Dana, hey, would you mind tagging me, you know, Instagram or Facebook and tag me? And and she's like. And she because Leslie just sent her a text. Mm-hmm. And Dana called her and she said, like, wow, what, tell me the, what is this again? And she said, well, have David, you know, here, here's my producer's number. Have David call my producer. And the producer said, wow, this is awesome. We're going to go live tomorrow with it. Crazy. But overnight. Yeah, we got 100,000. You know, when you get when you get new impressions like that and downloads, you know, mm-hmm. that's that's how you know, your podcast will go. Mm -hmm. It's not having 25 million over. It's like, just get 10,000 right here. Right, right, right. And, and by the way, uh, for the folks listening, you, you got to check it out. Um, I, I uh, don't have a lot of opportunity to, to listen to podcasts myself, ironically, (laughs) but I, but I did make the time to listen to several uh, and uh, and they're a lot of fun and uh, so I want everybody to make sure they take the time to check that out. Um, I also mentioned you know your newest uh, venture, Hubcap Moses, which I also checked out a little bit. Um, what I could find online and yeah. I mean you guys sound amazing. Talk to us a little bit about, a little bit about that venture and how that came about. Yeah, thanks. So um, that's Tim Acres. So. In Nashville, Tim has this 18-piece funk band called Tim Akers and the Smoking Section. And it's just all top Nashville session cats. And they do, you know, everything from Shaka Khan to Michael mm-hmm. Jackson, Earth, Wind and & Fire. And they just sell out everywhere they play. Well, it's hard for Tim to get 18 players. You know, he's constantly having to sub out four or five just to get a gig and it's a lot of work and uh mm-hmm. he's like man i'd love to have just a streamlined little funky r&b greasy thing and i said well me too you know I, i've got all kinds of new ideas and so we just got together for a write and um just real quick you know it came together just mm-hmm. real quick and mm-hmm. so yeah we've been having a ball we played our first gig uh may 7th out in the Leapers Fork, Tennessee, at yeah. this Buckets, little general store, mm-hmm. and uh, that, it was, that, so, was that. That's the one that is online. That uh, catching some of the yeah. some of the performances. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's amazing. I'm looking forward to seeing what what you guys do. Uh, you guys got signed right away. I mean, before you even performed, right? Uh, yeah. So, so it we're gonna. We're, yeah. So that's Steve Emley, who was a manager with uh, Fitzgerald Hartley in Nashville and, and they handle, you know, Vince Gill and Michael McDonald and Leanne Rimes and just all these acts. And Steve has managed <clears throat> throughout his 25 year career um, and tour managed. And, you know, he's just, he's just a player respected in, in Nashville. Mm-hmm. And um, Tim and I were actually at a nightclub one night to see this great guitar player, Scott Bernard, who plays with Kenny Loggins, to ask him maybe he wanted to join Hubcat Moses. And um, we're just sitting there watching because Scott's playing in this Toto cover band that's just killer. You know, it's Mm -hmm. just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. We're like, man, 
they sound better than Toto. You know, you go see <laughs> Toto now, and it's like, you know, the songs are yeah. good, but, you know, yeah, yeah. You have just fresh, crack musicians playing those songs. Anyway, right. we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, this guy, Steve Emley, and his wife, Joanna, come walking in, and, and they're all big hugs on Tim. And it's just, you know, that's how that's how it's done in Nashville. And sure. you know, my, my advice to anybody listening, you know, if you want to be in this business, if you want to be in the music business, and, and yeah, you can have your YouTube channels and your, you know, do your thing, your videos. and mm -hmm. <clears throat> But there are 100,000 singer-songwriters in a 30-mile circumference in Nashville. And there's mm -hmm. 100 people moving there a day. Right. So to get into, and you can go play down on Broadway on those clubs, you know, and you might be, you are great. You know, if you're playing there, you're, you're great, man. And you love music mm -hmm. and you want to, but you have to get into those inner offices, you know, you have to. Right. And it can't just all be about you. <laughs> right. In fact, you know, do very little talking is my advice. Just go hang, you know. Yeah. You got to bring you, something to the table. I mean, you know, it, I, I, and you do. And that's my point is you are, you're great. If you're going to Nashville to make a living at, you know, you're great. So it's almost like music, you know, it's not, the music just gets done. Cause I, it was interesting. I was saying to Steve Emily, cause he's like, I, he, I'm, he's starting this new label. He's like, this is great. I want to sign you guys. And he'd heard like two songs and I said, well, we don't, I don't, we don't have a band yet. And he goes, Hey, <laughs> if Tim Akers is involved, I don't have to worry about the music. You know yeah. what I mean? That's what yeah. he said to me. So it's like the music is <laughs> that'll just take care of itself, man. You know, yeah, we have to kind of we have to, we have to worry about some business over here. Right. Well, you know, I, I and I know, um, you know, we, we talked before and, and you're like, hey, is this going to be about an hour? I said, yeah. And I know we're going way over and I could go on all day. I do have a few things, though, because I know we both have to get back to some, some really making some money or whatever. But um, uh, a couple of other things I wanted to go over. And I'm glad you touched on that advice, because that was one of the questions I was going to ask you about, you know, what advice you would give. One of the things I've loved about you over the years is that not only are you a great showman and singer and musician, but you really respect the process. You really respect other musicians and performers, and you you shout, do the shouting out for them as you've done during the course of this discussion, and you do it on your Facebook page. And and so I I would certainly encourage anybody who is interested in learning um, how to be successful to do what you're doing and recognize greatness and recognize, you know, who has been successful and emulate that. Um, one of the, you know, I, we've talked about all these projects and you've got so much on your plate already, but what, what, what do you have on the horizon? What are you anticipating as far as the, the rest of the year? Cause we've obviously been through a hell of a time with, with COVID. Uh, a lot of people are anxious to get, you know, the wheels churning, you know, Besides the, the things we've already mentioned, what do you have as far as goals uh, coming down the road? Yeah, thanks. We're already uh, starting a, a second podcast. Um, it's going to be, um, it's a whole different thing. It has to do with um, HR, with expertise on helping businesses with <laughs> Nice with their HR because right. some consultant. Uh, it's just a it needs some needs some help. You know that that uh, area mm -hmm. of, of business. So and again, this is a, I just met a guy from Boston who's you know been in consulting. I, I asked him, "Do you like podcasts?" Oh yeah, I was starting to get into that a little bit, and then I tell him what we're doing. And he's like, hey, man, I've got, I know a thousand experts in the field of, and it's just, so all of a sudden I'm like this, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why, but it's my, it's all on the journey, Denny. There's, there's no destination, you know, yeah. it's just being open to it. Just like 
my wife saying, hey, that's a movie. Well, let's write it. Sure. Hey, I want to do a podcast about, you know, HR development and, and really mm -hmm. streamlining the consultant uh, employee experience. And, and so, I mean, I'm looking at my phone here as we're talking and it's blowing up, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I hear you. And, it's, it's and, you know, and we've been contacted by Spotify. When, when you go to number 13 on the Apple iPod charts, uh, mm -hmm. podcast charts, you know, the, uh, um, you know, Spotify, Amazon, and Apple are buying up everything. So that's been the goal. So mm -hmm. I think the goal is this year is to just kind of ride this out and sure. sell and do it again. Well, I, I'm I'm definitely going to have to check out that HR uh, podcast because my employees, you know, even though I'm I'm an attorney, my employees tell me I'm an HR nightmare. So I don't know how that works. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, I want, before we, we, uh, part company for today, I want, uh, to play this little, would you rather game? Okay? okay. And as a, as a music guy, this might be interesting. Um, so would you rather be forced the rest of your life to listen only to Broadway music or only to Christmas music? <laughs> Christmas. Yeah, I think I'm with you. Um, all right. Would you rather be the front man for a band that only had a few hundred fans or a band member that's way in the background, but has millions of fans? Oh, wow. A front man or a, or like a, just a. Just, yeah, you, 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 nobody knows who you are. You're in the, in the band, in the far, you know. So who knows what you're doing? Because nobody knows what you are, but you got a million fans yeah, versus the front man. That guy. Yeah? In the back. The, w yeah, okay. Uh, would you rather, because oh, it's similar, would you rather be um, a one-hit wonder with a song everyone knows um, or have tons of song songs that you have a small but dedicated fan base for? One-hit wonder, without a doubt. And yeah? my advice is do whatever it takes to get a hit. Yeah. Okay. Compromise all your, <laughs> not your soul, but your, you know, I mean, right. There's nothing like having a hit. It, it, yeah. The sync licensing, because then, then you'll be able to ra relax and do, you'll, you'll be able to afford to do your passion. Do the rest of it. Gotcha. All right. Would you rather be a talented songwriter who can't sing or a great singer who can't write? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, talented songwriter who can't sing. All right. Now, I know the answer to this already. Beatles or Stones? <laughs> yeah. I'm a Beatle. Yeah, me too. Although I um, love Keith Richards' five-string tuning. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. I've just been writing on that recently, and I just, I, I'm just such a fan of the Stones. Yeah, yeah, I am too, but yeah, yeah I'm still the Beatles all the way. Yeah. Um, okay, now we get away from music a little bit, but would you rather have a mullet all the time or a ponytail? <laughs> mm. <laughs> ponytail. Okay. Would you rather be able to control animals or see the future? Whoa. I'm a dog whisperer. All right, all right. Would you rather be tissue paper or toilet paper? <laughs> <laughs> this interview is heading to the toilet. <laughs> toilet paper. All right, last one. Would you rather have universal respect or unlimited power? Oh, my gosh. I think, you know, respect is, uh, is a powerful thing. I think you have to earn respect. I would. All right. I would enjoy All right. Respect. I thought you were going to say um, respect is an overrated thing. Give me the power and I'll buy the respect. But <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, man, this was so much fun. I, as I said, uh, we could go on for a, a long time and I definitely want to get you back here and uh, report back on these projects and how everything's been developing and, and explore a few other things in the future. But uh, uh, thanks so much for being here. I, uh, uh, it was great, great talking as always. You too, pal. Thanks so much. And, um, you know, I want to talk about you creating this podcast. Like I said, I mean, let's hopefully, you know, we can do some business down the road. 
Absolutely. So, again, I want to thank you all for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe and like Uncommon Convos on your favorite podcast platform. Also, please check out our other podcasts, speaking of podcasts, uh, Legal Squeaks, where you can learn more about legal issues and consumer issues that might impact your daily life. Again, check out UncommonCombos.com so you can watch this video and, and or the video of this episode and other episodes. Hope that you'll tune in with us next week for another Uncommon Convo. And in the meantime, uh, be sure to have a great day. Stay safe. And I love you all.